All right. Well, this is the show. I am here with Betsy Mars, and you're on Make Your Own Fun. So there's a whole litany of things that you do. So I don't know if you want to tell the folks kind of a little bit uh, what you do. Obviously, you know, um, mainly a writer, but I know you do some things with education. So however much of that you want to get into, you can or not, or however you want to handle it. But yeah, I'll just give you a few seconds here and you can kind of say, you know, kind of what you're doing or what you're working on if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, I come a few seconds. I can, I'll try to condense it. They, um, I kind of come from a background of a lot of educators and um, I always kind of uh, held them in high regard. So of course I didn't feel worthy of being a teacher, but I did fall into uh, working in special education when my kids were young. And then um, after a while I I had gotten my substitute credentials, so I started doing that after my father died a few years ago. <clears throat> and that, that allows me more time and flexibility with my, uh, to help my elderly stepmother. And um, as I mentioned in our chat, my son has some mental health issues and depression, and so I want to be available for him. Plus, uh, my main thing these past few years, since I got back into it and with um, more dedication is writing. And so I really wanted to be able to put my time into that whenever I can. And um, so this also permits me to do that. But um, the only downside is I had very good benefits through the school district. And now I'm constantly feeling like I shouldn't refuse any work because it- it, Yeah, too much of a good offer. My $1,000 a month insurance um, has to be paid and- but yeah, I, I got, um, when I got, you know, older, older, it took me a long time, but I finally decided, you know, life was too short. And as my mom used to say, it's not a rehearsal. So I finally started putting my work out there, I think around 2014. And then I was, I, I, if you get me into this, I'll just talk forever because I've been very, very lucky. I mean, well, we, can, we can, you know, parcel it out. And yeah, we'll parcel out. it out. But I did, I was very lucky. I just want to say I've had a just a, a bunch of things happen and I've you know fallen into very fortunate situations and now my other thing that I'm focusing on is photography so that's one of my photographs in the background is someone said when I get up from my chair I walk into this crow <laughs> so, <laughs> oh is that what that is yeah I can totally see that where oh okay yeah 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 now that you move yeah and that's a that's a bunch of the that's actually the same crow on the bottom but it's it's a bunch of little little crows and the big god crow or whatever he is. I, so. I do have to warn you because people have used the the zoom uh, backgrounds and stuff if you hold up like a um a book yeah or a cd it they're like and this is my and it's a, <laughs> yeah. it, it looks like you're um, it's like the cheshire cat like a mirage and people are like you, you're what <laughs> it happens it's just the you know it's a chroma key thing and the background is like we can't it's the object is too small and uh yeah it's so funny i've had I, i've had my cat appear on my head out of nowhere and i did actually do i had a book come out with my friend alan wallowitz we we co-authored a book that we started pre-pandemic and we finished it during the pandemic and we did a bunch of readings and we had that experience because my room is sort of a disaster most of the time and so I, I you know I was trying to hold up the cover or whatever and um I've seen things disappear and come in and out so it's it's pretty amazing it's magic um I don't know I could you know I'm like I can turn off my background I'm not quite sure what you'll see behind me <laughs> it's just gonna be somebody back there with a bowl of cereal going like <laughs> and then they slowly just mop it their way out of the frame if, if, if you just um, if you see um if it's pointing a certain way you'll just see a bookcase and that looks impressive and writerly but then if you if you if it's pointing down you'll see the disaster on the floor so that's fine i mean if i were to turn mine around you just see um like a christmas tree um uh, a bookcase of DVDs that we don't watch anymore because of streaming. Thank you, streaming. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. At some point, probably down the line, they're just going to become like elaborate kitschy cup coasters or something. I don't know. And okay. then um, a half-empty bookcase. I've slowly started, but it's like I um, I moved earlier this year. I, like 
very very suddenly like our um our landlord was selling the building like right in the middle of COVID oh we were like are you kidding because the market was a seller's market yeah. so out and then it's like I got rid of so much stuff because I've moved I think ooh, four times in the last five or six years so it's been a lot of um what George Carlin calls just making the smallest version of your stuff <laughs> because it's you know you've moved in your life you know it's such an enormous pain in the ass because um you're always breaking something or something gets bent or twisted and turns yeah. it and if you I've been lucky enough to only need to use movers I think once or twice in my life but there's no matter how nice the, the people are and how bulky and beefy they are there's always just something that gets um nicked or yeah bumped against something or... I still remember my brother helped um, my brother helped me move one time and this is decades ago and he kept assuring me you know no no it's secure it's secure and next thing I'm driving behind him and he's dragging the dresser down oh. <laughs> down the road and it's like oh my god the only the good thing for me is you know I haven't moved in uh, I don't want to say how many years but um, I haven't moved in so long that it is easy to accumulate things so I've I have been, it, you wouldn't know to look at my house, but I've probably taken 15 trips to Goodwill and I've put things on the curb and I've given things to people. And but yet the stuff just, just it's multiplies. It's just incredible. It's just, and, just to reference that George Carlin bit again, which is um, you get to a certain point in your life when the things you own are just a pile of stuff with a lid on it. Which is the top of your the <laughs> top of your house that's just funny. lowers yeah. onto the you know it's almost like a shell silver seating thing too where it's just the roof just gets lowered onto the, your stuff and you just live <laughs> you just live somewhere in there. I like I like that vision. I had that experience, but so far that's mostly in the garage. Although oh. I do I do actually have two tubs behind me. <laughs> But that's from an aborted attempt to organize my photos when my, my daughter was helping me at one point and then she started refurbishing a dresser and abandoned me. So um our bathtubs, you weren't trying to do some kind of um Jacques. Oh, a tub, just, a, just one of those, you know, oh, plastic, plastic tubs. tubs. Yeah, yeah. So I have bags of photos and she was, you know, I said, you know, while I'm alive, you know, we should <laughs> You've got to really go through this stuff, yeah. Pretty morbid, but yeah, we were trying to say um, all the things that didn't make it into albums before everything was digitized. You know, I've got um, just bags and envelopes of photos. So we kept saying, okay, this is, she was helping me separate them. And, you know, we have a million baggies saying, you know, Halloween 2003 and this and that. So It's amazing. Um, kids have no reference, no need, or no time for photo albums. I want to say, when I say kids, probably just anybody that's a teenager and younger, because for them, their photos live on Instagram or other things that might be like their own websites or things like that. So they're not even really tangible anymore. I mean, I love yeah. like old framed black and white photos. I think black and white photography is almost becoming like a lost art. And well, this yeah, I mean, I've got, I know, hear me and do one of those. Yeah, yeah. I can't see anything. <laughs> no, I agree. It's not, um, I mean, I had discovered, I was looking for some other documents and went into a filing cabinet and forgot I had put a pile of photos. That's the other thing, I, you know, as people pass on, you know, I'm one of those people who can't help but take on their stuff. So I've got stuff of my dad's and I, um, I have found a pile of photos and I thought, you know, it is really nice to have that tangible object, even if, and it, maybe even especially if it's crumpling or I found, um, maybe well, I and just the framing. And, you know, um, one great thing about photography too, is um, the photographers used to have people pose and the most, right. and you obviously you look at like photos from the 1800s, where it's just people's facial muscles just gave out because they were smiling <laughs> For 10 minutes and after a while, at the, at the end of it, they're just morose. Oh, I, I forget, you know, that's interesting you bring that up because um, I took it, shoot, I took it out to the other room, but one of the photos I found was, must have been my 
great great grandparents maybe even older and they were like one of those typical like russian polish jewish couples that are very dour looking and they have it's just you know your face can't stand that long <laughs> and my son made the point because i said you know look how you know, miserable they look and you know i know they were not very well off so he said this is probably their one big thing of shot at immortality that they put their money aside to have this photo taken and he made that point that they probably had to maintain that facial expression for so long that maybe that's why they didn't smile he thought it might be easier just to hold a neutral expression than to smile for that long and that hadn't occurred to me until he said that and then it's interesting that you brought that up one thing that um i oh, never yeah. get over and it's always funny and it's probably intentional <laughs> and they started doing this um even when i was a kid in the 70s if you would go to get like family photos taken at um like places like sears or kmart or something back in the day and they stopped doing it after a while because it just looked ridiculous because i've been in other people's houses where they have these photos of their families or their kids and i don't know what possessed these photographers to tell them look over my shoulder to the right but then look surprised but you're happy <laughs> surprised. and it's always like you know the movie Step Brothers with Will Ferrell where they have yeah. those sweater vests on yeah. with like the horrible like gray Are you carpet talking about background. my children's photos and they're always like this <laughs> just kidding and they're just looking off at something I'm like, what are you even looking at I always tell people just look straight on if you're doing you know like a promotional picture or um or a headshot or author photo unless you just get that great random friend taking a yeah you know, those are the best but you can't plan on that all the time um which i think that's the the one that, that you have that you're using you know with the sunglasses it just looked like a friend was just like catching you in the middle of a laugh or you're enjoying a story and that that's the best but those photos where people are just looking at something like just imagine there's a giant, you know, thing of cotton <laughs> candy over there and the people are just going. Uh, yeah, I'm not very good at acting and I'm very self-conscious about having my photo taken. So my daughter that day can actually convince me to take my photo because I had come back from the hairdresser and that's the only time my hair ever looks like, like it looks like it's supposed to look or, you know, <laughs> like it's supposed to look like you just came out of the beauty salon yeah, in an it was, ideal kind of world going through your hair i mean it had you know people kept saying oh you have like um the you know tips or that uh what do you, you know gradient what do you call that um you know hair and they thought i'd spend big money on it or whatever i said no that's just the remainder of my hair dye i thought you were just gonna say it's just natural that's the remainder of my hair dye and, and um in that case it's so funny too because all these people were saying oh it's so glamorous i said that's my um target tank top which i'm also wearing now <laughs> and i had a like an old jacket over my shoulders but i guess it looks kind of like i'm you know wearing some shawl or something yeah it kind of does it looks really high fashion like you're sitting there in the um cafe outside of a big fashion show and they've got you, you know, they, they snapped a glamour shot just really yes. quickly while you weren't paying attention. So no, I just I happen to have had a skin treatment and I happen to be <laughs> and um, I'll usually smile for my daughter. And that's, you know, one of the only people that I feel like I can trust to be <laughs> take my photo. Well, you know, like I said, I call them happy accidents. And it's, uh, yeah. it's always nice when that happens. So um, hop in your way back machine of choice whether it's a delorean or that thing that looks like santa's sleigh in the time machine movie and um let me know kind of when you were younger what first got you into uh writing was it more maybe um books that you were read or someone gifted to you or things you found at a library or maybe they were song lyrics that were very poetic or something like that i'm kind of curious Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, I don't know. I always joke that I, I'm actually working on a project, a collaboration that's sort of about who we were and memory and, you know, what we make up and what stories are actually direct memories versus what you've told or been told so many times that you, you know, you think you remember them. And um, I do know that my parents for all their faults. No, I, I love my parents. <laughs> for all their faults, they both 
you know, love literature and I'm sure I was read too. I do remember that um, one of my favorite books apparently was Make Way for Ducklings and actually have a poem I wrote um, sort of along those lines that I'm trying to get published somewhere and uh, about stories. And, uh, and so I know I love Make Way for Ducklings and I know one of the, my still um, favorite books is The Little Prince. And I think, um, there's something about it that, you know, I just, I loved the part where, you know, he says, draw me a sheep. And finally, you know, he, can, she, he can't get the sheep right. And finally, he just gives him a box and says, the sheep that you want is in the box or whatever. And that tickled me so much. I still get goosebumps thinking about it because it really reflects, I think, the power of imagination. And that story is just so beautiful to me about, um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day about, you know, two of my cats are just these, you know, what I would have once upon a time said these ordinary, you know, ginger cats. And now to me, they're very distinctive, you know, <laughs> and in the story, Different personalities. Yeah. And everybody, you know, you've got the field of roses, but only the one is his, his rose. And he knows that rose and loves that rose, you know, uniquely. And so I know that somewhere around here, I still, we, we lived in Brazil um, for two years when I was little, and we, I do have a copy of The Little Prince in Portuguese somewhere. Wow. And then I have, um, I have probably, you know, so many versions because my daughter gave me a 3D version. And then I bought her when I was in France, I went to um, the aerospace uh, Airbus Museum in Toulouse near my friend, where some friends live. And got my daughter a French version. And I think every time I see a copy of The Little Prince, I just want to pick it up. And um, my daughter actually painted me a little wooden thing saying, avec le coeur, which is with the heart. You know, you only see rightly with the heart. So I, going back to that anyway, I think I loved, you know, that. And music, I grew up um, listening. My parents were really into folk music, and the, you know, Beatles, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Bob Dylan, um, I have a couple of one of two of my most cherished possessions are um, Beatles albums. I think they're the English version, but the covers are in Portuguese. Oh wow! My parents were into it, you know, early on, and I think um, I love the lyrics. And I think you know, I was always just really into the lyrics, and I love Dr. Seuss, and I loved all the um, uh, Kipling stories, you know, and um, I think you name it, I just loved, I like the sound of language. And I think having uh, lived in Brazil for those years, I did, my brother went to an American school. He was a little older. And for whatever reason, my parents fortunately decided to send me to a Brazilian school. And I really think that that was an important experience for me to, um, I, maybe because I could learn the language more easily being that much younger. And I think it also just made me appreciate language and um, and it was interesting kind of being the outsider, you know, and that's also given me sympathy in my work and education. I love doing ESL classes because I always tell them, you know, I was the one who was the language learner. And um, I really appreciate them, especially when they come in like middle school or high school, you know, it's really hard. It's harder. And you've got all the hormonal stuff going on, too. But oh, I was yay, hormones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So let's jump ahead and kind of um, talk about, so I understand kind of maybe you were saying some of the influences, but you yourself, when do you think you started writing just for like the joy of it and not in like a school setting? I mean, was it more like middle school, high school, do you think? No, um, actually going back to Brazil, my dad always swore and I, I don't know if he kept it. I haven't come across it, but he swore that I wrote a poem in Portuguese when my cat died in Brazil. And I've always been an animal lover. And um, I, and I think it was, you know, basically my cat died, my cat died. I'm so sad. <laughs> it starts somewhere, right? It just comes pouring out of you, right? Yeah, but I think I always did. And even um, I'm sure I wrote, I, I remember another memory I have is uh, in my dining room growing up, which, you know, it was more like the kitchen off, you know, like the little area off the kitchen. We didn't have a formal dining room in that house, but I remember we had a bookcase full of um, encyclopedias. And one of my most comforting things would be to go under the, I like Dave Matthews and there's the song under the table and dreaming. And I always think of myself as this child being under the table with my encyclopedia and I would open it to something and then I would create a story around um, something I discovered in the encyclopedia. 
so I was writing, you know, I would try writing stories, um, poetry. I definitely was writing in high school. I don't think I was, I wrote, you know, I got on the newspaper in junior high and I, you know, we were trying, oh, in elementary school, I remember us writing a, a play about a drug overdose or something because we had all, like, all those fear, you know, scary movies about how you're going to die. You know, you're going to go on from uh, marijuana to some heroin. It's overdose. the gateway, right? Isn't that it's movie called drug. Reaper Madness? Yeah. So we were kind of brought up on that. And I remember dragging in some black lights and, <laughs> you know, fluorescent posters and we created this set and they actually let, I think they, I need to talk to my friend, but I'm sure they let us put this on in sixth grade. And I think it ended with some tragic overdose. So. <laughs> I can't imagine a bunch of 11 year olds just saying like, my life has come to this. <laughs> <laughs> While you're off smoking pot in the bathroom. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. Uh, so um, what was your kind of first brush with um, maybe open mics and kind of oh putting out chat books and things? Was that more of a college situation? No, actually, I was too scared then. I did. Um, but you don't seem like a, like a mousy, inhibited person. You seem really like outgoing and vibrant and you're constantly smiling. So I don't know. I don't know. It's funny. I guess I've gone through different phases and, you know, I am really prone to depression, actually. And I do want to mention that because I actually make a point of mentioning it because I want to try to take away the stigma of what someone with depression or mental health issues looks like, because I think a lot of people don't like to admit it because they're afraid that they'll be, um, you know, either discriminated against or, you know, I don't know, they have some, or, or people have some conception of what someone looks like who has mental health issues. But I, I think, you know, I tend to be what my friend in Australia said once that I'm an ambivert because um, I tend to think of myself as an introvert, but I can also be very extroverted, obviously. But in college, you know, I was going around, you know, reading Emily Dickinson in high school and wearing black all the time and listening to Joni Mitchell. And, you know, I was a vegetarian before, you know, it was like at all a thing and there was nothing you could find to eat. And I was just, you know, pretty dark and, um, in college, I think I, I did have one poem published. I just pulled out my book the other day in my honors program. I did have one poem published, which was very um, much influenced by E.E. E. Cummings, who I was really into and still love E.E. E. Cummings, just the, the playfulness of the language, I guess. And um, But I didn't really do, you know, other than trying to write stories and I did try to write travel things. I think I tried to avoid poetry because poetry has that. Some people are just like, I hate poetry, you know, I hate poetry. <laughs> and, I, and you can't make money at it. So I think I tried all these different things, but I kept coming back to poetry. I was in a couple of writers groups with other mothers and non-mothers. And, you know, I just kept coming and I'd always often end up writing poetry <laughs> despite myself. And um, so it really wasn't until like I don't know, seven years ago. And the first time I went and I was going to try to read my poem, I just couldn't read my poem. And someone else read my poem for me. And I, I literally sat there weeping. Um, it was at the, um, oh, what's it called? The pond. Uh, oh, pond anyway. water. Pond water. Thank yeah. you. Been there many times. Beautiful. Yeah, John, John Youngkins read my poem and I just sat there weeping and weeping and weeping. And um I was so touched and, you know, I felt exposed, but also touched and just, I don't know why. And then subsequently, you know, Rondi. Yeah. Okay. Rondi's kind of, I have to give a shout out to Rondi because if it weren't for Rondi, I don't know if I would have gotten into publishing my stuff at all. So she's the first person who published me in one of her anthologies. Oh, and, a poet is a poet. Yeah. I think yeah. we were maybe in the same issue. Yeah. And so, um, and then, and then she put up something one day that said, oh, you know, I really recommend this workshop. And it was with Brendan Constantine at LACMA and it was free. And I, I was just coming out of this. Always the right price. <laughs> yeah, it was the right price, but I was just coming out of this phase where my dad had been ill and I just was trying to get really did it, get into writing. And I thought, oh, it's probably full. It's too good to be true. And I hadn't heard, I didn't know who Brendan was at the time. And so this is what I mean by falling into things. So I thought I'll get on there and I'll see if I can sign up, but it'll probably be full. You know, I'll be safe. I'm okay. And, and then I got in and I'm like, oh shit. You know? 
damn it. <laughs> so that that was sort of my first, you know, thing, and then it kind of snowballed. And um, but yeah, I didn't. I, and then subsequently, have done a few open mics and feature. I had a um, someone actually. I was just been very lucky because Shannon Phillips actually approached me and offered to make a book for me. Wow. And so looking back, you know, I it's not a theme. I would like to do a chat book that's more thematic and it was more of a collection, but you know, I, at the time, um, other things were going on as usual. And so in the end, I gave her what I thought were, you know, some of my best at the time and she ordered them for me. She said, you can order them or I can order them how I think. And it was very interesting because the way she ordered them was not how I would have. And yet I really liked how she ordered them. Yeah, it's, then, it's, it's, you sometimes you need that outside uh, influence looking in because you're so in the um, eye of the creative hurricane, you can't see what's outside going on. Or the well, I would have done it more like, a, you know, I tend to think more in, a, what do you call it? See, I'm, I lose my words, um, you know, sequentially or, you know, and, and um, she started with this poem, Synesthesia, which was about a, an experience where I had smoked some pot and I had this, you know, I was seeing, I was seeing color. I was seeing music as colors. Oh, cool. And, and um, yeah, my son's very jealous. <laughs> He's like, damn it, I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, it hasn't had that experience. So I, I wrote this poem, but she started the book with that. And it was kind of interesting because I, I forget, I asked her, you know, back then why she chose to open with that. And I think it was because it was entering kind of into a different realm or I, I don't remember. She'll, you know, she'll, she'll tell me I'm wrong. But anyway, I thought it was really interesting because it never in a million years would have been the way I would have started that book. <laughs> Um, it's interesting. I I kind of jealous of writers that a little bit uh, I guess more comfortable with um, like arranging short stories. And I when I do like a it has been a while since I've done like a featured reading, but I was just telling um, Raul Clement the other day when I talked to him that I kind of see it. Uh, as almost like a um, concert set list where, um, and it's just me, everybody's different, but I like to do something short and punchy to start with to kind of get their attention and kind of hold people. And then also end with that because you don't want to end with like, I don't know, the fucking Iliad or something where people are just, <laughs> we've, all been, we've all been to readings where, and this is no slag on anybody's writing, but there's, it's just certain, I, I don't know how to not be a dick when talking to certain people about this, but it's just like, we've all been to a re those readings where someone's reading like what feels like a 15 page ode to like dandelion that grew up <laughs> in the pieces of the sidewalk in front of their house. And it's and a it, very resilient dandelion. I know, but it, we're like 15 pages, <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Um, I was afraid I'm going to be that person, but none of my poems are basically, I'm lucky if any go on to a second page. <laughs> I mean, and the thing that sucks is it's not short. so much that the writing is bad. A lot of it is delivery and you just learn over time. Like one of the things he and I were talking about the other day, it's just over time, you just learn to be more of yourself and just have that, like what we're doing, just having a conversation instead of just being you and me. It's like, 15 or 20 of you in a bookstore or a cafe or yeah. something it's just like hey how about that you know it's almost like it kind of almost dovetails into stand up but you can bring it back if you're going to talk about some serious stuff too but I'm just always uncomfortable like you know I think part of my reason I was so afraid to read too is I've seen people like Brendan if you've seen Brendan Constantine read he's just like you know he's so you can't take your eyes off him and he's but so remember he also started in stand-up comedy 20 years ago oh, and he's he? been doing this a long time wow i didn't know that but i know yeah. this comes from an actor family and... right so but you I just gotta you know you gotta put that in your head of like you can't just jump on a stage somewhere and be awesome and have all and be like you know i guess i'm trying to say like fully formed but some it's of like, his nature you gotta and take the punches just... with you know, getting used to being up in front of people. But so, some people are just more um, comfortable performing. And I think my, for better or for worse, I just, 
It's a I learned don't. behavior, though. I mean, I, I remember yeah. when I was in, God, June, middle school, um, high school, even in college, just being terrified. And, you know, well, a lot of it has to do with you've got a professor sitting 20 feet away and they're doing this. <laughs> right in a tweed jacket with the patches and I'm like where did you get the fucking pipe from and they're just, <laughs> that's what my dad it. my dad was that person pour out your soul and I would be judging you <laughs> my dad wasn't judgmental though but I did envy his tweed jackets with the elbow patches it's like something out of a um I love those jackets. Wes Anderson movie or something like yeah. why is everybody wearing tweed jackets I, I guess it's know. New York in the 70s it's, all the time a- it's a look it's you know it's it's the I am a professor look but yeah no I just I don't know I I I really it's not that I judge anyone else for performing because I appreciate a good performance I just feel so like I don't know I feel like oh that's funny Mike um I feel so (laughs) this is my daughter says I'm like a rodent I'm like oh is it (laughs) that's funny Oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's just kind of what I've officially just used for the show because it's always just a good icebreaker. But go ahead. I don't like um I always feel like I don't know, a fake or like an imposter when I'm trying. And and so the only the good thing when my book came out was <laughs> I remembered what I was going to say. So my first, when I did my book launch and it wasn't, it was sort of deliberate, but it was also to comfort myself and ground myself. But both my parents were gone by that point. And I knew two of the poems. One was, um, see, I was going to grab my prop, but you wouldn't see it probably. You're, you're welcome to turn that background <laughs> thing off if you're see. worried about showing me. Uh, let me see what you I'm can... literally just in front of a wall. I'm sitting on a couch. That's... I know, but you guys, you have no idea how my room... Let's see. Let's see. How about that? Ah, no. There we go. No, that's probably not going to work either, right? Um well, one thing, I don't know. Oh, that's weird. I don't like that. I brought my mom's perfume. Okay. Which shows up in one of my favorite, best loved <laughs> of my own poems. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me see. Now you're outside. Now, now I'm back in New York. Um, and anyway, I uh, do you like the crow better? Uh, I like this better because I'm kind of jonesing to do any kind of walking or anything outside, but go ahead and um, say what you're going to say. And then I, I thought of another question for you. So. Okay. So I brought, I brought the perfume and um, I brought one other poem. I mentioned something about my father's cardigan. So I brought the cardigan and I thought, A, it reminded me that, um, that they were dead and that, that I was going to be also, and also that, <laughs> and that I wanted to make them proud of me. And um, I was doing this for them to kind of fulfill their, probably somewhat fulfill their hopes for me and also have something concrete of theirs that I could hold on to and say, you know, they were here and it helped me. Like you said, it is harder. I can see how it's, it is different even if you've been performing and doing comedy because poetry is so, it is so personal. And I think if you don't get into the the poem and the feeling in the poem, then you're not going to deliver it. And even me with my, when my mom told me I had a monotone, so that has made me very self-conscious. But um, I think, you know, at least the only thing I try to do that, you know, I feel saves me at all is I really do try to get into the heart of the poem and where I was when I wrote it or what I was trying to express so those objects really help me you know they're they're little touchstones and I get that one one thing I was going to say in regards to you know kind of performing performing uh work um it is really hard if you're reading something that you wrote 15, 20 years ago to get back to that place or the, that person or what you were going through that kind of inspired it. So there is a, a, a sliver or more than a sliver of uh, performance art that comes with it because you're reenacting whether 
I just remember when I was first, you know, reading like what I would call drivel, just sitting in the back of a reading and just writing something just to have something to read. And it was just something that I experienced three to five days before. So it was so visceral, so fresh. So when I would get there, and there, was, there were times and there's YouTube videos of me out there somewhere where I feel like it's just awful. I, I just look, I have like this crazy mop of curly hair and I just look like I'm screaming into the microphone and it was just like <laughs> so like raw and so like punching the world. I don't know. You know, it's just maybe whatever I was going through at the time because um, just being freshly moved to uh, California. But that also, I believe I read somewhere that did, didn't you live in Connecticut for a while? Well, we were, I was born in Connecticut. My father was a professor at the University of Connecticut at Stores, and I was born in Willimantic, which I guess almost went bankrupt a few years ago. And my brother and I said, oh, our birthplace <laughs> almost I... seemed to exist. But it, um, I don't know, that probably was longer ago now. But I, it's funny because I, you know, growing up, I never knew anyone who knew where Willimantic was. And then suddenly uh, when I, I wrote one poem, that was in um, Rise Up Review. And one of the people who commented on it when I went to check out his profile, he was living in Willimantic. And I thought, is this person for real? You know? like, no they, one lives there. Humans don't stalking? live there. <laughs> like, I thought he was some you know, fake person who created that just so that we would have something in common. So that I, you know, like, this I was, is my like, in with her. <laughs> yeah, I'm Will This is my icebreaker. She's going to be obsessed with me now. And then um, one of my, my best friends, Alan Wallowitz, with whom I wrote this you know chat book that we had out during the pandemic. And we, we did go around and read it. And, and we did actually think about the set list because he's a edu you know, long term educator and he's very good at um, knowing how to, you know, do his his uh, he would always create the curriculum or whatever for our readings. And um but he also, we, we encountered each other on, I think first Silver Birch and then Verse Virtual and this and that. And when he checked out my profile, he saw Willimantic and he had lived in Willimantic. So Willimantic has brought me these friends, <laughs> but I only actually lived there for a year. And then my father got a job with the um, Metropolitan Water Commission or something in Wisconsin. Wow. And he also, my, I didn't realize it, but my brother said he was an adjunct at the university in Madison. And then after 18 months of Wisconsin, he, he um, was like, boo, snow. He's like, I'm getting out, out of here. Out. Snow sucks. Not nothing, you know, yeah, because I know a lot of wonderful poets now who live in Wisconsin and the seasons, you know, look beautiful and everything. But he said, I think at the time we had two of the worst winters on record. Oh, it looks beautiful. Key phrase. <laughs> yeah. Key phrase there. But my dad had been in the Navy um, and he had been in some kind of training in Monterey at one point. And he said one of the stories, you know, I always started back to stories, you know, growing up was that my dad was sitting on a beach on New Year's Day or something in Monterey saying, okay, one day I'm moving to California. And sure enough, after a year and a half in uh, Wisconsin, he got this position at USC. And um, that's that's why we ended up in Brazil also. So we came to LA briefly, but I've only, I only lived in Connecticut for one year. And um, my friend, I have a friend in West Hartford who says next time I come out post COVID, we're gonna go try to find my my home or the hospital I was born in or something. Oh, cool. We're going to go tour Willimantic. I have a uh, almost flip side experience with the town that I'm from, Kent, Ohio. Um, uh, being born in the 70s and kind of growing up in the shadow of um, what happened in 1970. But kind of like you were mentioning Joni Mitchell earlier with her big yellow taxi song. Um, they've really, well, for lack of a better term, paved over the town in terms of now they have five story parking garages. Um, they moved like the public library. They rearranged bridges around the river. They've totally like wow. re rezoned things. They built giant, you know, five, four or five story um, dormitories on the campus to 
I mean, there is a memorial there, but you really can't, you'd have to go look for it. It's not like it's, you know, if you've ever seen the um, old documentary footage of what happened, and I think there's like a Robert, uh, who's the guy that wrote um, oh, um, Hawaii and Kent State and oh yeah oh, I want to say Mitchum but I think that's an actor <laughs> is there is a Mitchum it's not Mitchum it might be it's Mitchum. like oh I, I feel stupid that I don't remember it's like on the tip of my tongue but anyway um yeah it's like the little town that I grew up in and went to school it's like not really there it's I think that just happens with commerce and progress and you know um, one of the cafes that I used to um, perform in with my comedy group is a Starbucks now, but it was like yeah. so weird because it was like this old like Swedish, um, you know, A-frame building with plaster and they just kind of gutted it out and put the Starbucks stuff in. Oh, eh. yeah. um, but I have a lot of great memories and, you know, I still talk to quite a few people that I performed with and a lot of great artists came out of there. A lot of bands a lot of musicians it's still like a really thriving artist community but they always keep telling me like, you need to come back because now they have this 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 and then like well yeah but los angeles or orange county has all that and more and i mean to me it would be just like going back and like you were saying reminiscing and i'd like to go and see some of the the cafes and the stages around the campus that i performed at you know but I don't know. It's kind of similar to, um, I was talking to Raul about this too, with holiday get togethers at a relative's house where it's nice to get everybody together. But um, after three or four hours, you really start like either going into yourself or going to another room and looking at your phone. And you feel so obligated to be there because you haven't seen these people in six months or a year. But then the little thing in the back of your head is like, get me out of here. Well, we don't have families. So. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, you guys are all kind of under one roof almost. So. Well, I don't, yeah, we, I mean, that's the sad thing. I mean, in a way it's sad, but at least, you know, I understand that experience. I can imagine that experience, but we have so, we, it's funny because my dad, well, my parents moved from the East Coast and my dad was brought up in an Orthodox Jewish household and he really separated himself from all that. So, um, even growing up, you know, there's like that part of the family. And I was pretty close to his brother wasn't, you know, so religious. And uh, and I knew his his brother, that uncle I really loved and his wife. Um, but a lot of the family was, you know, on the East Coast. And um, we didn't really see so much. We saw more of my mom's family who was in New Jersey, New York. And, um, and then just, you know, it's like a very, my mom had, you know, one brother and two half brothers and my dad had one brother. So they're not big families. So we never had that kind of extended family thing and they were so spread out and there was so much, uh, you know, weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> Estrangement. Oh my gosh. I don't want to interrupt the nostalgia fest, but we are 47 minutes and more into this hour. And, uh, haven't heard you read any poems yet. So I don't know if you set a couple aside, if you want to read a few. I did, but God, I want to, I had the cats open the door again. Can I? I think that what I don't know. Do you want me to just like read poems? In uh, okay, where is it? I had it marked. Darn it! What happened to it? Okay, I was gonna read. Um, oh, here I'm on that. Um, not to get too morbid or depressing again, but uh, yesterday, as I mentioned in our chat, was the anniversary of the suicide of somebody I really love, and. Um, and he's, you know, definitely, I don't know if you'd say a muse is probably the wrong word, but I, I'm processing him a lot through, uh, in his death, I guess, more his death than him. When I write, he comes up a lot in my poetry. And I think it's because, especially with suicide, and especially given that he, as far as we know, didn't leave a note, you know, it's one of those things that really haunts you. And 
And so I think, you know, it's my way that since there will be no real resolution possible in a way, it's my way of resolving it myself. And um, and now I'm afraid to read, though, because I, I do, I, I don't have the most um, animated reading style. But no, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and read so um, we'll some stuff in for you. This also goes back, we were talking about the pandemic. During the pandemic, I know a lot of people are having really vivid, intense dreams. And I do have to say that um, dreams are a great source of poetry. And as a therapist, one of my therapists and I talked about, they really align a lot. The po poetry and dreams in your subconscious, you know, definitely really align. So I, I did write a lot of poems that came out of dreams. And this is a short one. Um, but it was one night, it, I think it was about a year ago. Do you remember there were like crazy, crazy winds in the night? I don't know if it was as as wild in Orange County as it was up here, crazy. but it was, it was just crazy. And so um, this poem is called Red Flag Winds, and it's uh, for Charles. Charles returns on a gust through an open window. In my room, curtains billow, blinds lift. Paintings hung on nails shift as air comes in. In the night, the house shakes with what could be a foreshock. A door slams as the house seeks equilibrium. As I settle back into sleep, he laughs, his mouth full of air again. We find each other in the hall. There is no aftershock as we gra grapple with our luck, the wild joy of it all. And that was one of my really, it was a beautiful, <laughs> I'm getting teary thinking about it because, you know, it's so, so nice when it's a rarity that, you know, he comes to me alive like that. And it was it was really uh, incredible. But it was like a weird combination of the reality of the I think I was in and out of dreams. And uh, it, it was it was crazy, like literally some of the um, I think I had the window open and the art. Some of the art was um, lifting off the wall and. So it was really wild. But another one that I want to share is okay, the pandemic. Yeah. When, this is on a sort of a lighter note. It's another pandemic poem. And one of the things I know we talked about, what did you do during the pandemic? And my, as I mentioned in our chat to my daughter and um, her boyfriend, they're very cautious, which I do admire. And yeah. You know, Cat wants to go out, but I'm ignoring him. Um, and so for a long time, we didn't see each other at all. And I was, you know, worried for them and for myself that we, you know, we're feeling very isolated and there was just nothing happy happening kind of. And um, then I know, I'm sure you're aware that some of the drive-in theaters were kind of revived. Mm -hmm. And growing up, um, we always loved the Shrek movies and all the sequels would come out around my daughter's birthday. And so for many years, you know, for several years, we would go to see Shrek on her birthday. And so Shrek was playing locally at the drive-in. So I said, how about this? You know, can we get tickets to Shrek? And we even went in separate cars, even though it was stupid in a way, because I think it was like $25 a car and I could have put you know, six people in my car, but I went by myself and they went by themselves. And so we went to the drive-in. And um, so I wrote a poem about that that was published in Sky Island and it's called Seeing Shrek at the Drive-In During a Pandemic. <laughs> um, ogres are like onions and I am too, taking off the outer skin for a couple of hours to be close to kin. I peeled my gloves off after the ticket taker hand, hands me a menu for the snack bar, edge away as far as I can from the van they wave me next to, which is spilling laughing children. The dark descends, Shrek slouches before a rising moon, donkey nearby. I sigh in recognition, alone in the swamp, heat of my enclosed car, shutting out the unmasked. In the car to my right, my daughter behind glass, windows up. We communicate by phone and gesture, with thumbs up and heads bobbing to the soundtrack of her childhood. I am trying to atone for all my layers, the rawness, the cutting, the weeping of the onion, the irritants which sear. In the castle, a dragon slumbers, ready to fire up its scorching breath. At night, I assume my true form, hope, that I might be loved anyway. By light of day, I spin candy floss from spider webs and balloon whatever frogs come my way. Wow. Okay, we could do one more, but you just got to cut out the preamble and just- Okay, no preamble. <laughs> I'll say um, this is a, 
actually, I wrote this around last Christmas, but it just got published in Sheila and a Gig, and it's a more um, positive poem, I guess. It's called Christmas Cactus. Christmas Cactus, I say, and I know what you're thinking. Another poem about resilience, comebacks, flowering in cold times. But this is not the cactus of your imagining, full and abundant, a cascade of green and bursting buds, the red and green of childhood holiday dreams. This one is thin, just a handful of limbs, leaves pale droppings in the window box from overwatering or negligence. I barely glance at it anymore, except to wonder when it will collapse like the basket it arrived in. Yet, you knew there was a yet. This morning and tonight is Christmas Eve. We have rain and looking out the window, I couldn't help but see the end swelling and pinkening, almost enough to make the atheist in me believe. Wow, very nice. That's, uh, wow. Um, and those have all been published, you said, right? Yeah. That's great. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you a, a little time here at the end if you wanted to um, kind of promote your um, <laughs> social media or websites or anything that you have online. If you've got books on Amazon or anything like that, if you want to just let the folks know that are watching where they can find your work. Okay, great. Um, well, my first, my chat book um, from Picture Cho Press is called Alinea, and I have a few copies <laughs> that I can sign for anyone. And it's on Amazon. And then um, I co-authored In the Muddle of the Night with Alan Wallowitz. And he's one of my best, best friends. And um, that's also on Amazon. And we also have copies of that. We, we did about, we had an internet, we had a tour of the country during the pandemic. So we did, I think, six or seven readings, New York, Sacramento, Kentucky, this and that. It was really, it, that was fun. And we had, might have one more reading in the new year. Um, and then I also, uh, started a press a few years ago, uh, surprisingly, and I created, uh, put together, however you want to say it, I have two anthologies I put out, and one is called um, uh, Unsheathed, and that's on Amazon, and I might have copies, and one, the next was Floor. The first one had 24 authors from around the world, and the line that, um, it was around the prompt, the line was knives cut both bread and throats. So everybody was supposed to incorporate that. And the second one was uh, another one based on a, po a line from a poem that someone suggested. And that has 27 poets from around the world. And so that was pretty, that was really amazing. And I theoretically, I'm gonna do another anthology, but those are the, the four books that I have out. And I have a really bad website. <laughs> on WordPress that I haven't updated for a while. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm slightly vaguely on Twitter occasionally. <laughs> and I've also started doing a lot of um, photography. So um, I've had a few poem photos published and uh, I'm gonna try to get a better website going, but- There's always next year. There's, I mean, yeah, next year is a couple days away, so. Yeah, that's true, it's crazy. Um, so I wanted to thank you, Betsy Mars, for being on the show. Believe it or not, you are our last interview of oh 2021. God, oh my God. <laughs> and <laughs> this will air um, on the 30th. And okay. then I have already pre-recorded a crazy little um, New Year's um, thing with uh, my co-host, uh, Jennifer Joyner Penman. And we're going to um, get really silly and talk about drunken debauchery from New Year's past and lots of embarrassing stories. So that'll go up on Friday the 31st. So um, this is basically my last uh, recording of um, 2021. So I wanted to say thank you everyone for being on the show this year. We just started it a few months ago. Thank you to Betsy. Uh, I know we were trying to get you on the show for a while and you were fantastic. It was so great to hear your poems and your stories. So um, that's basically it. And uh, if I don't hear from anybody, um, have a happy new year. Happy new year to everyone too. And I'm really honored and appreciate being asked and um, hopefully it wasn't too off task. I tend to, you know, once I get going on certain things. No, no, no. We all go off tangents. It's like, I just say it's not like a proper interview. It's more like a conversation. So it was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.